Hello, welcome back to the channel. In this video series, I am providing the high-level overview of the Salvadores textbook structure in architecture. This video is about chapter 14, and that is all about structural aesthetics. Um, so there is no architecture without an aesthetic component, as we already know that. Um, so uh, but people always ask, is there any aesthetics uh, of structure? And uh, if there is, does it influence on architecture deeply enough for architects to take an interest in it? So um, when we answer these questions, uh, we may ignore the definitions of the beautiful and notice instead the aesthetics tenets change with time, a piece of architecture considered a masterpiece at a given time is demoted to a second-rate achievement in another, and vice versa. The tenets of our aesthetics vary, but the satisfaction of aesthetics need uh, is uh, one of the permanent aspirations of humanity. So uh, uh, throughout the history, there were many architects who were trained like as engineers and engineers who used to be architects. And uh, there are both uh, of them. So uh, please refer to the textbook. You can see the uh, bridge, the Salgina Va uh, Valley of Switzerland. And that's designed by Swiss engineer Robert Maillard and completed in 1930. So that's um, one of the most iconic bridges. Uh, that is designated an International Historic Civil Engineering Landmark in 1991. And the bridge is noted for its graceful form. Um, so uh, when we consider the influence of structure on architectural aesthetics, you must distinguish those buildings in which structure is relatively unimportant and hence not uniquely determined from those in which structure is essential. So the appearance of a single family house rarely depends on its structure, which may be of wood, stone, concrete, or steel, whereas that of a large suspension bridge is inherent in its funicular nature and requirements for span. So buildings between these two extremes have structures that by influencing their appearance in varying degree, influence the aesthetic response of their users. So uh, let's move to the next subsection and that's the semiotic messages. Since the early 20th century, the concept of the semiotic message of a completed building has become widely accepted by architects, architectural historians, and other specialists in the field of construction. Semiotics, a branch of philosophy developed over the last 90 years, considers any and all human activities and products from the particular viewpoint of nonverbal or sign communication. So communication consists of messages. Verbal communication is concerned with the transmission of meaning and to this purpose uses the words or uh, of a given language. Verbal communication is totally dependent on the culture in which the language is understood. Nonverbal communication comprised of symbolic imagery, uh, however, may convey a meaningful message that could also be verbally expressed. The semiotic message of a road sign may stand for the English language no parking, but um, for example, in contrast with the verbal message, it is understood internationally through the now classic P with a diagonal slashed circle. Uh, so on the other hand, a semiotic message may also be the byproduct of an object or artifact whose main purpose is not to communicate, but to perform a function. So um, please refer to the images here in the um, textbook. So both kinds of semiotic messages are found in architecture. The push buttons in an elevator perform a specific function, but also express 
semiotic messages related to their function of moving the elevator to specific floors. The message of a window instead communicates something beyond its intrinsic function of transmitting light and air. The bare, uh, barred windows of a jail says clearly, this building is a jail, while the ornamented windows of a Renaissance palace state uh, the status of its owner. And uh, uh, please refer back to the images. So the meaning of a semiotic message, as much as that of a verbal one, changes with time. The pyramids communicated a religious message at the time of the pharaohs, um, an incitement to glory to Napoleon and his troop, and a mixture of artistic, sociological, and structural meanings to the modern visitor. Uh, structure introduce, introduces in architecture two kinds of semiotic messages. When it's not visible, the structural component of the architectural message may not be apparent, uh, even if the building may depend essentially on um, the structure. On the other hand, buildings structured uniquely by the requirements of statics express a semiotic message that, while not independent of its architecture, it's strictly related to structural action and acquires a meaning of its own. So let's uh, move to the next subsection, and that is the origins of the structural message. So uh, structures must, uh, by simple reality of their physical existence, respond to the forces of the environment in which they originate. Uh, wind and water are primary form givers, and gravity will have a different impact at different scales of an object. These forces of nature shape the form of all natural things from the most delicate spider web to the greatest tree. It is not difficult to observe that mm, at a quiet unconscious level, we all have an instinctive response to environmental forces in our own bodies. Uh, so uh, we see exactly the same principles as we see in our body, like when we stretch an arm or when you um, just uh, move around or twist, we can see the same principles um, in the branches of a tree. So uh, these progressively add weight as we look closer to the trunk. Uh, and furthermore, the long moment arm means that is necessary for the branch to be thickest of all where it joins the tree. Uh, so um, it follows that these natural forms create within us uh, an innate sense for the appropriateness of human-made structural forms. Purely structural messages originate in its intuitive understanding of structural action, stemming both from our physical experience and the perception of structural form in nature. Uh, please refer to the images. You can see the uh, Cretan and Doric columns here how they were developed and you can see the appearance and uh, how it is um, topped. Uh, you can see the, uh, the different uh, structure here. So uh, natural arches have taught us that stone spanning a gap must acquire an upward curvature because this material is strong enough in compression to support a mountain is weak in tension. This intuitive understanding of arch action can be extended to three-dimensional structures like domes by referring to our experience of living in caves. Caves do not explain the required thickness of domes, but this cannot be appreciated either from their inside or from their outside anyway. Um, also, similarly, the Vine catenaries linking tree to tree show us the need of downward curvatures in tensile structures, a feature that even modern engineering must use in suspension bridges. And uh, you can see here there is the correct and 
incorrect cantilevers, how that is positioned. Uh, so there is an instinctive feeling that the cantilever on the um, that is uh, thicker towards the wall is uh, right uh, versus the one that becomes thicker by the end, it, then that it, uh, feels that it's awkward and unnatural. Again, refer to the images here. You can see there is uh, the inverted pyramid building in Tempe, Arizona. And you can see the Great Pyramid uh, of Cheops in Egypt. So um, you can see how actually we perceive those shapes. Also, uh, another one uh, is another diagram showing the simply supported beam as well as the haunched built-in beam, how that feels. So recent research in fabrication techniques has resulted in concrete beams formed in a more optimal shape that follows the flow of forces in a beam. The resulting form may seem to many to have a graceful biomorphic appearance. We instinctively gravitate towards organic forms of nature, so will structures designed with these techniques receive a universally positive reception. But uh, some historians still uh, try to um, argue and see that um, actually that is the future when we try to fight the nature and just create something different. So um, with the production of strong, inexpensive steel framed hinged at their foot, made their appearance on the structural scene in the 19th century. But because their structural behavior is complex, their message is still um, equivocal to the layperson. While the curved shape of the arch has a strong aesthetic uh, charge, a frame, if correctly proportioned, can be aesthetically pleasing too. And you can see the uh, section showing a hinged steel frame. So, um, similar reactions are elicited by those correct structural forms that have their justification in subtle physical phenomena. For example, a compressed member with a shape dictated to avoid buckling is looked upon as a component of a machine and is hardly viewed as beautiful or ugly. In fact, for a long time, machines were considered ugly because their shapes are correct functionally and structurally, uh, they could not be accepted as elements of the universe of aesthetics. So let's move to the next subsection that is scale and the structural message. So the semiotic message of human-made structures is not influenced by scale because the message refers to common experiences of the race that have to do with form and not size. The comparison of the dome to either the seashell or the sky is significant in its context, as is that of large tensile structures to a spider web, which always elicits feelings of surprise. Because of extreme efficiency of tension fields, Tensile structures, whatever their geometry and size, are also light in appearance and considered intriguing and beautiful. So please take a look. There is a beautiful image showing the entry of the uh, Lloyd George Courthouse in Las Vegas, Nevada. And you can see the massive columns that are shaped uh, here in place. Um, also, refer to the image of the machinery. And that's the drawing after Francis uh, Picabia work here. This is uh, Stiglitz here. So uh, you can see uh, that was created in 1915. Also, there is a comparison of a spider web and the Munich Olympic Stadium, how the tensile structure is organized there. And you can see there's like a direct uh, comparison here. Also, another image is 
uh, the, um, the 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 representation of the Spanish architect Antonio Gaudi, uh, who was among the first to explore the use of funicular form in compressive structures. So you can see how actually he uh, created the model of the Guel Colony Chapel in Santa Coloma de Cervello near Barcelona in Spain. So a series of cable supporting sacks of uh, Bakshata's weight was used to find the architectural form of the shell structure by imaging the structure upside down. So this is quite interesting. Please refer to the images here. Also, let's talk a little bit about aesthetics and structural correctness. So an understanding of structural behavior is seldom needed for aesthetic appreciation. And um, an example of this unimportance is given by the general admiration for a roof shape seldom understood structurally. The roof structure clearly illustrate the tensions that can exist between structural form and aesthetic desires. From a structural standpoint, although fabricated as a truss, it is a reality. It is in reality a simply supported beam with maximum moment at mid span. For structural optimization, the greatest beam depth must therefore be at the middle of the span and then taper and thinner at its ends. However, in this case, it has been shaped in the form of an arch with the last, with the, excuse me, with the least depth at mid span and greatest at the ends, even though technically speaking, no arching behavior is occurring. Um, so also refer back to the images, you can see the, uh, 25th of April suspension bridge crossing the Tagus River in Lisbon, Portugal, and also the um, uh, Zdjakov Bridge spanning the Vlatava River in the Czech Republic. So that is quite interesting to compare them side to side. Also refer back to the images. There is... Um, uh, the St. Aloysius Parish in Jackson, New Jersey. And also there is a Cathedral of St. Mary of the Assumption in San Francisco, California. So it's quite interesting how uh, they are put together. And if you look at the roof, it's uh, quite fascinating. Uh, another example here, uh, structurally incorrect, beams. So you can see the appearance actually can be deceiving. And uh, here there is um, there is a picture showing the um, John Hancock Company building in Chicago. Uh, that is quite interesting. And you can see that it actually deceives uh, the looks uh, the looks actually uh, deceive and it looks incorrect. And we are moving to the last subsection here, the final one, and that is the message of structure. So uh, you can see the Eiffel Tower here. Uh, there is a big picture of that. And first, the Eiffel Tower. Um, for the people thought that it's going to be like an, a mechanic, mechanistic eyesore. Uh, but actually, the, the Eiffel Tower rapidly won the hearts of uh, Parisians and became the very symbol of Paris and arguably of all of France and now clearly recognized by individuals from all over the world. Um, so the semiotic message of a structure is influenced by our personal experience and the cultural experience of our society. The relative importance of these two factors is illuminated by the classic example of the Eiffel Tower here. Uh, and uh, this is how we can actually establish the perception of structure. Please uh, take a look at another example, and that's the George Washington Bridge. 
uh, the proposed CLAD uh, and uh, so you can see the proposed CLAD and how it was actually constructed on CLAD. Um, so when the structural frame was exposed, uh, the uh, people actually considered that really undesirable. But that was a cost saving measure uh, and all the cladding was omitted. And that led to a new interpretation of exposed structure as a formal expression. So when completed, it was the longest suspension bridge in the world, a title that it held for only five years until San Francisco's Golden Gate Bridge uh, was opened in 1937. Also, uh, there is a, a photograph of the Pompidou Center Museum in Paris uh, that was inaugurated in 1977. So first, a lot of people just uh, did not like the building uh, and the aesthetic message was based not only on its structure but also on its mechanical systems. Uh, but it was accepted in the light of our recent past. So uh, this is, uh, if you have not seen that, I highly recommend to uh, look up um, uh, uh, the building, the uh, Center George Pompidou. Uh, this is uh, quite interesting. So the structure is exposed and you can actually read how it was constructed. You can see the lateral bracing and you can see uh, the whole structure. And first it may look like it's just uh, like the scaffolding is there. So the building is unfinished, but actually it is a finished building. So we can see that actually exposed structure can be beautiful and that perception changes throughout the years. So that was it for chapter 14. Thank you so much for watching. I will see you in chapter 15.